everyone. It's Monday, February 20th, 2017 at one o'clock Eastern time, and this is Admissions Live. I'm your host, Nicole Lentini, and on today's live broadcast, we're talking about the pursuit of a master's degree later in your career. Admissions Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Our episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Be part of our live broadcast by sharing your knowledge. Participate in today's discussion by tweeting us using the hashtag Higher Ed Live. All of our episodes are free and easy to access in the video archives at higheredlive.com or take Higher Ed Live with you on the go by subscribing to the podcast. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a digital first ed agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. Trusted by thousands of higher ed professionals, M. Stoner webinars are jam packed with timely, strategic, and actionable knowledge. Check out their library of on demand content from digital storytelling to myth busting websites. We're tweeting a link now. And without further ado, I am excited to welcome my friend Jason. Um, and we, this is actually a topic near and dear to my heart because uh, I am 10 years deep into my profession and um, really trying to think carefully about the pursuit of a master's degree and my time spent at a one year, uh, spent at the same institution, my full career thus far. Um, so I'm excited to talk to somebody who's had a similar experience. So Jay, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your, uh, your background in higher ed. Hello, Nicole. Uh, yes, um, I've known you since you started in this game. If, it makes me feel a little old as much True. as you talk about your <laughs> <clears throat> So my name is Jason Hodge. I'm a senior admissions officer with the University of Connecticut. I have been with UConn as a professional since 1998. Prior to that, I was an undergraduate here. So it's been, I've been with UConn for a very long time. Uh, longer, it seems, each day. I, it's been fantastic working for this institution I graduated from for all this time. Uh, while I've been at UConn, I've been able to do international recruitment, been recruiting across the country. I am involved in our special programs section here at UConn now, which is honors and scholarship and our combined undergraduate and graduate programs. You know, it, I've been fortunate enough to be able to take roles outside of the office as well, which is why I think I can still stay here. Uh, I've been involved with NIACAC for multiple years, I, chair of the um, yeah. annual meeting twice. I was on the, gov on the governing board a couple of stints, and I'm currently on there as the chair of the Articles of Organizations and Bylaws Committee. I've been on Summer Institute for five years, the Advancer Institute for a cycle. So I've got a chance to do things outside of the office, which has made the experience of uh, Wonderful, uh, no question. Uh, one, but the nice part about admissions is for all the travel and the wheeling and dealing and the hotels and the nights and things. Uh, sometimes you don't want to go back to school. And I didn't really want to when I first started this. I was having too much fun. And UConn at the time uh, was a more traditional you have to be here to be in the classroom school back in the 90s a lot of things have changed since the 90s uh but i ended up pursuing my degree a little later in life um well thank you that gives actually a really good framing for all the questions i'm gonna ask so thank you for laying that all out um because uh, one of the first things I want to jump into, although I want to address the NIACAC stuff later for sure, um, is how did you end up in admissions? So you graduated college and what kind of drew you into that path? Uh, so the funny part was I had no desire to work in admissions. I didn't even know this was a career field when I was going to college. I came to UConn on a very generous uh, merit scholarship. So I had had a little interaction with the admissions office during one of the, what I learned is a yield event. I didn't know what that was at the time, uh, <laughs> but I really had no desire. I was gonna go into criminal justice like everybody was back in the nineties and I was set to leave here. I was working, I was started off you kind of as an engineering student, but not did not pursue it all the way through. Uh, my time here, that's why I switched to criminal justice, but I was still working at a nuclear power plant on the shore in Connecticut called Millstone Nuclear Power Plant. Uh, and I was work finishing an internship that they kept me on even though I changed majors. And I was here after graduating uh, from you kind of like that summer before I uh, got to go off into the real world, my car broke down uh, right in front of the admissions building. Uh, when I, <laughs> yep, one of the, uh, the, sub, the serpentine belt snapped. It was my grandfather's car. It was great, but I did not maintain it very well. And so I'm waiting for a tow truck to come. Now, this is stores in the summer of 1998, which means nobody was around. 
uh, way back when, we didn't have any summer programs that early and that sort of thing. When the admissions uh, officers came out, we were talking for a little bit. Uh, he knew my family. I had heard of him, and he told me there's some jobs and in this line of work. A few months later, after bopping around some kind of temp jobs and insurance and, and furniture and just random stuff, uh, I ended up being a, a what we call a roadrunner, a temporary admissions professional for one cycle. And then I ended up landing a job here as a counselor and, and have been here ever since. So never really desired <laughs> to do this sort of thing. But so it had not been for a poor car maintenance, I wouldn't be here today. Isn't it funny to look back and realize the tiny little things that if they had been slightly different, totally would have changed the course of your time in the field? <laughs> oh, ab absolutely. There's no question that um, for all the things that I've seen and done, it's just been the littlest details that have changed the direction. You know, had I not recruited in New Jersey, I would not have made the wonderful friends I did um, mm -hmm. and relationships I've had since. If I had not attended UConn because I originally wanted to go to Dartmouth. I would never have been in this line of work. So it's just the little things that, and it's sort of why I don't take this job necessarily. I take it seriously, but I also know that things can happen. So you kind of just got to roll with it. <laughs> it's a good, good general philosophy to have in this field. I think between that and just the uh, other duties as assigned, you know, mm -hmm. is probably if you can, if you can take those two uh, kind of thoughts in stride, I think you're well prepared to be in the field of admissions. Totally agreed. <laughs> yeah. Um, was there a moment that you realized like, oh, this is going to be a long term path for me? Or has it just sort of happened, you know, as time has gone on? It's funny, you know, um, anyone who knows me in the office knows that I don't, I have not changed much in the last, say, 10, 12 years, except maybe a little older, but there's still a lot of fun. So I don't know the day that this became a career, but I think okay. it was probably about the fourth season when I knew where I was going. And back then we had to use maps, no GPSs and, or the stars, if you could do it at night, you know, with a, with a <laughs> compass and a sextant, like an old Navy ship. Uh, and about the point, like, I know exactly where I'm going at all points. And in a state that I had never been in, except to go to the zoo once in New Jersey, oh, this may be just a good fit. And I've been lucky and fortunate enough to to always have the opportunity to try and do different things, getting involved with annual meeting fairly early on. Uh, but thanks to my coworkers, helped me get out of the office and see that this is a larger profession. Um, I got involved with some of the union uh, committees here at UConn to understand what the university really is as an entity. So it, it was never so much that there was a moment that I knew this is what I wanted to do. It's been a series of moments that have made me happy that I do it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Oh, I like that. Just they've kind of built up over time and you found yourself sort of in the space of this is right and this feels right. And I can attest to even though I don't share an office with you, I know for a fact you do not take it too, too seriously. You take it seriously enough to uh, be able to help your students and your institution and the families you work with. But um, as somebody I know who has one of the largest uh, Nerf gun collections that I've ever seen, I think it's safe to say you, you have a good dose of humor with it too. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we need uh, t stress breaks. Absolutely. So yeah, occasionally they will come out. Absolutely. Um, well, so we framed this conversation kind of around the pursuit of a master's degree a little bit later in your career. Um, and kind of I, when I was putting this um, this episode out there, you know, really framing it as um, even myself as kind of 10 years deep into the role, I've realized that not many, not many people that I've worked closely with um, have as I have to kind of look into this master's option. A lot of admission counselors come in and jump into a program earlier on. But I really am kind of heartened by the fact that you sort of are in the same boat um, where you started a program a little bit later. So just kind of looking back, was there, you know, when you first started in the job, did you see yourself as, you know, ultimately pursuing a master's degree down the road? Um, if you did, did you have any thoughts about that? Or what kind of was that sort of path ultimately to bring you to pursuing one a little bit later? Uh, so I will tell you up front, when I graduated uh, back in 98, I never 
thought I was going to spend another hour in a college classroom again. Also, well, it's funny why I do this sort of thing for a living, because I spend enough time in classrooms in this building, in this university, but never thought about it. I was like, I'm good. I'm done. My father, who was a principal, retired, uh, was always saying, you got to go back to school. I said, absolutely not. I'm not doing it. I, I was good. And I also didn't, to be fair, though, I didn't know this was a career. I did not not think there were other opportunities at some point I might want to explore. Never did, but never thought about what those would be next. So it wasn't really in the cards as much as I was encouraged by my father and then subsequently later on by my uh, supervisor, Brian, um, who had really said, you know, you should consider it. And I thought about it, but really hadn't pursued it. One of my coworkers, she went back and got her MBA uh, but she was transitioning out of the travel piece in our office to do more things in the office. And I really had no desire to give up the cyclical nature of the travel season as part of what, what we do. On the, in the fall, I'd be on the road for about 10 weeks. In the spring, probably six to seven. Uh, it's fun. As anyone knows, you get to get social network. Uh, so the, the prospect of you know, being in New Jersey and then trying to get back here for class was was never something I really thought was all that appealing. And between the two, I'd rather kind of just enjoy my life and, you know, my friends and the travel, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It got even progressively less likely when I picked up international recruitment for five years. Uh, but during that time, actually a good uh, friend of mine who I travel with, his name is Nick, uh, he was actually pursuing his master's at um, SUNY Binghamton, I believe. He was working for Binghamton at the time internationally. And I was, I was well, how do you do this? Like, how do you take classes? And he had, was in a relationship, married, and but he's also with me in Vietnam. I was like, how, how do you do this? Oh, I talked, you know, the, by the nature of their graduate programs, they're more online than what I understood our programs to be. So like, oh, that online thing seems like it, it could be interesting, but at the time, not a lot of the things that we did here would have been. And also, to be fair, I didn't know what I wanted to go back to school for. You should never pursue uh, for the graduate study if you have no clue why you want to be in the classroom, because there are some times I was like, why am I here? This is brutal. But not knowing and really not having a sense would have, was the two things that really kept me out. I should have mentioned one other person who really encouraged me in the beginning, additionally to my father, my supervisor, uh, was a, my, who ended up being my college advisor, Scott Brown, in the School of Education. He had known me since I was a freshman. Here we were on the committees because I was involved in student government. He was on a committee that I was on for searching for a new vice president for um, student affairs. And he'd always come in touch with me and always encouraged me to go back to school and I didn't think I really had it in me, but he never gave up on me, uh, never did. So coming up by three fathers, just kept <laughs> it up. Around the time that I had finished international travel and around the time that a lot of the newness of everything, I was winding down, friends I used to travel with were all over the country at this point. I was really just doing in-state work. I was doing more in the office in terms of administrative things. Um, a new set of three people made, uh, made abundantly clear that I had no choice in the matter but to go back to school. And that was my current supervisor, Ida, our director, Nathan, and our VP for enrollment, Wayne, pretty much made it abundantly clear that that was the thing I was going to do next. Um, and so I finally sat down and talked to Scott uh, seriously he gave me a couple pointers, took a few classes, and I began my education degree. Wow. Talk about kind of a, a little winding road to ultimately get there. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, though, because a lot of things that you said 
resonated with me, um, especially the, you know, kind of not being sure what ultimately to study. I, I enjoy education. I, I like be, I like learning. You know, I I mean, I do a higher ed live, you know, in, in, in a window of time. I love, you know, providing and learning um, from other, like providing education to others, too. But um, but I've had a really hard time trying to nail down what I care about enough to pursue higher education and, and uh, advanced education. And so I think it's funny. Do you feel like if you if you hadn't gotten that nudge from those later three people, do you think that still wouldn't be something that you'd be thinking about? Or did you start to feel any way like it was time or was it really that nudge that got you? Uh, you know, it's, it's even funny, I would say, and this is the most ludicrous component of this story, if you can imagine so far from what you've heard. Uh, so I got the nudge directly and I took two classes, a non-degree, one in the fall, one in the spring, one was Scott's class. Uh, so it was a nice introduction to graduate learning. The other class was a quantitative methods class, stuff I have not done. And this is the, 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 the complicated part with going back later. I was 35 at the time when I started. So things I haven't done in 15 years. It was at that juncture. I'm like, oh, yeah uh statistics it's it's been a while and i don't remember what half these things are and it was definitely that feeling of i can't handle this i i i'm not in the, the i don't have the, the framework you know to to do this anymore those skills have eroded and so i i stopped uh for like a semester got a cat which is the funniest part of the whole thing and kind of settled into like having responsibility um, and kind of getting life together. i'm like all right i think i can do this but i need to take it at a pace that makes sense for me so it, it, i also recognized academic writing was a skill set that i needed to get back into and sharpen because i had just you just if you don't if you're not in school you don't write academically, you write for business, you write for social, but you're not writing papers. And that was still really, for me, uh, the, the trickiest part. What I came to appreciate and why I tell all of the people who, are, who have not gone back yet, the, the, Rick, the newbies uh, in our office or the younger staff, go back or don't wait too long to go back because you're still in that mindset. But with graduate education, it was just so much more focused than undergrad uh, and that made the experience better also my program the cognition instruction and learning technologies program at the university of connecticut was so variable and that i could do what i wanted to do which mm -hmm. was i decided to work with developing younger professionals in a you know, in admissions that it, it made it a pleasure to be in the class because unlike undergrad it's like oh i gotta take economics because i have to and oh i gotta take music appreciation because i have to as graduate school it's like oh i want to take this class because this is interesting to me it, and it was more focused and it was adults around my age a lot of them in their phd programs which i understood but it, it was it was a totally different mentality of i'm here for a reason and that motivated me to take it you know to be a little more focused it was also interesting that when i got comfortable with it i realized what i brought to the to the classroom there's very few people in admissions at the age of you know uh, what i was at who have the experiences i have that i could share with educators so a lot of them were teachers principals um, curriculum develop developers I talked about this is what I see on the transcript and this is what I see on, you know, your your profiles and these things. And it made a huge like it was something different. So I actually had a voice when I thought initially I'd be intimidated that I'd have nothing to say because I'm not a teacher in an education program. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful insight and it kind of taps into a, a question that I wanted to ask, which was, you know, you talked about some of the, the difficulties, you know, be, having some time away from academic writing, which is definitely something that's on my mind too. And just maybe being a little bit out of practice with having to, you know, have homework and have papers to write and have studying to do and things like that. Um, 
but you know, I think it's great that you're also bringing up some of the really the bigger positives of it too. That um, the insight that you're bringing into the classroom. I mean, do you feel like you would have really been able to to bring those sorts of thoughts into the class or uh, into your classroom had you started in this program earlier? It sounds like really your time in in the in, in the um, industry really helped you. Oh no, no question, no question. It was absolute. Mm -hmm. If I was doing this at say twenty three or twenty four, I could have brought some of the things uh, to the to the table that I that I knew, but I just knew so much more after being in for longer <laughs> than half. So, in talking to families and and being able to share that experience of, you know, it's like to talk to a family about college or about their curriculum or, um, you know, to I've seen X number of different academic programs because everybody's transcripts a little bit different and everyone's got a different profile it, and it was just something that no one else really had but you know the international education piece by having gone overseas and just they're just things and also the, the skill sets we have in this job that people don't really realize until you have to use it outside of admissions like creativity and obviously the number of hours you have to put in so there's uh, dedication and a rigor you know certainly you need to be able to think outside the box when you when you're on your eighth week of travel and need to figure out how you can get from point a to point b with um energy in fact that's another thing presentation skills definitely had oh, yeah. a difference uh, i was just more comfortable sharing my thoughts and feelings and i noticed in some classes there was a real hesitancy to speak up uh, about your opinions when what we do all we do is talk and so at the head drunk was like uh, i got this this is about blah 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 that sort of thing and it was it was never intimidating it was comforting and part of that is probably just being older and realizing that i don't really care what you think i'm gonna say mm -hmm. something anyway but it definitely mm -hmm. became better when i had like i've got years in no matter what you say, I'm not really intimidated by you. So that was the good part, was not being afraid. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many great points you bring there. And also, I hope I hope I'm not the only one being comforted by this conversation. I hope there are others that are watching that are having sort of this same thought process. Um, and hearing, you know, hearing all these things is so encouraging because it's true, you know, the sheer amount of skills that we have. Sometimes it can it can be hard on the harder admissions days to be like, oh my gosh, my skills are only, you know, only admissions skills. Could I ever do anything else besides this? But it's true. I mean, I think we are very lucky in our industry to have so many things that are expected of us and so many skills that are expected of us and the opportunity to take on other jobs too which you know when you've gone as um as deep in the industry as you have i mean you're talking about international experience you're talking about um uh, working with combined bachelor and master's degrees i mean there's a lot of uh knowledge that you bring to the table that is so diversified that I feel like a lot of other industries wouldn't offer. And that's great that you've found the ability to bring that into the classroom and and not caring what other people think of an opinion is super <laughs> important too. So I'm um, glad you're able to use, use that in the classroom as well. That's huge. Um, and I think it's great too. I mean, you mentioned earlier your time with NIACAC and all the, all the, um, the different committees you've been on and the events that you've run too. And so, um, did you find that some of those skills carried over? And secondarily, how has it been to balance those uh, responsibilities alongside your job, alongside a master's program? Because that's something else that I think is at least on my mind, and I wonder might be on viewers' minds too. So sorry, that was a multi-layered question. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's actually, you know, it's an interesting question. And it was one that I initially wrestled with in the beginning. I, I had stepped away from NIACAC for a period of time as my work responsibilities increased and it, I was still visible, but I wasn't taking on a leadership role with the organization for a bit. Uh, about into my second full year of the, the program, I got asked to be the chair for the um, Articles of Organization and Bylaws Committee. I would say comfortably, it was one of the few leadership roles that I could do with my elevated responsibilities in the office and travel and recruitment and schooling. I was uh, co-chair for annual meeting for two years. There's no way I could have done 
uh, put the hours I'd put into those conferences at Assumption and Northeastern back in 04 and 05, it just, they took so much time. And we were a different organization then. We were a little uh, smaller as a group. Now the conferences are huge in comparison to the ones that I used to run. So I can only tip my hat to the chairs for the committee now, but things have been enormous lately. Uh, so mm -hmm. it was okay enough to know that this chair position, which not a lot of people want to do, to be perfectly honest with you, there's not a great deal of desire to, to be the parliamentarian and talk about rules and uh, things at, at these meetings. It wasn't as heavy a lift. Now, having said that, lately, with the number of changes to NACAC's um, governing um, principles and, and organization and bylaws, we've had to do a number of different things. Uh, so it made the position, which is generally relatively quiet, more active than I anticipated. But it's a good balance. I will definitely say I've been graced with having great e-boards uh, for an organization who know the balance and 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 understand you know what comes first and i've had so many good contacts in the organization that when i needed help i could go ahead and, and get the help particularly during votes at annual meeting that need to take place it's, but it was i've had the groundwork in of over 10 years of involvement with the organization that had a, a built up enough goodwill to kind of get through this so it only seemed fair that when they asked me to do it again I said yes, so I'm going into my fourth year shortly, as a, and it should be another two more after that, so a total of six years in this position. Uh, but it was knowing when certain things had to happen and when certain things just couldn't happen, uh, and mm -hmm. people were really understanding about that. The, the, in terms of balance, to, to further answer your question, there is a, a tricky part with school and the admission cycle that... I really grew to appreciate. So in any given semester, September and October are relatively okay with school. You're just starting the classes, so the work's gonna get progressively harder, but that's when the busiest period of recruitment is, September, October, uh, late November, or early November. So when you're traveling, school, except for perhaps midterms, wasn't as bad. When you get home to read, that's when your final exams are. So all of a sudden it's, I've got, and as a part, large public university, our reading loads are pretty substantial. I've got X number of applications to read and a paper to do. And I spent many fall semesters in this office, eight, almost seven days a week, eight days a week, it felt sometimes, <laughs> doing apps and doing schoolwork uh, after hours just to, to, to stay balanced. So when, when apps got heavy, so did, so did reading. Then there was that break the nice January where there's no school at all and you can just pound through apps because when the f spring begins in February, you're still buried in applications, but school starting. So it, luckily as applications wind down, school picks up. So it was just learning that balance was critical to understanding mm -hmm. when, um, you know, how you're going to allocate your time and luckily, there's a nice trade-off at a certain state. It's if you can manage it. Summer's up to you. Take Ooh. classes. Go. Well, but yeah. Yeah. Well, that, and that's like the time management piece is fascinating to me because that is that is just so many pieces to balance and so many to be aware of, right? You know, understanding when the busy periods are gonna be for the bylaws committee, when busy periods are gonna be for education and for the admissions uh, admissions world, which luckily, I mean, you've had so many years and it seems like that would help to like be very accustomed to how that kind of ebbs and flows, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And comfortably for anyone who's gonna go back to school later in life, the good part is you know yourself, you know your patterns i'm a horrendous time manager absolutely terrible so i had to learn that but i knew that going in um and so when i needed to go off to social media i'm like i'm i've got to do it when i've needed to stop watching tv you know it was a maturity that i had only wish i had known an undergraduate um, but you know what you have to do and you know yourself so much better so even the things you're not comfortable with like academic writing perhaps or 
remembering stats that you haven't used in decades when you are focused you will reacquire those skills and you will push yourself through you can do it i'm the uh, uh, i've learned and i think i was being silently um encouraged from the in ways i didn't understand i learned you can do anything you want to you just have to believe in yourself and a lot of the encouragement along the way even that last semester which was eight cl- eight credits of class plus three comprehensive exams plus the file review had kind of gotten larger we lost a few staff people it it was a nightmare except from that semester i know that there's nothing i cannot do in terms of a reading load or work-life balance because i had seen the worst possible uh, combination of all things i was trying to finish last uh december and so that was a lot of things to try to get in at one point and did it but no, there's really nothing I can't do. And that's the beauty of those difficult times, right? Is you just slog through it at the time, but then afterwards, anything else is like, oh, I got this. This is a piece of, piece of cake compared to juggling all this stuff. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It, it teaches you. It teaches you how far you can go. And you can go much further than you think. Absolutely. It's really, really nice advice and, and here uh, on my end of things as well. Um, before I get to the next question, I just want to remind viewers if they have any questions, um, you can use the hashtag higher ed live and I will make sure to ask Jay. Um, so feel free to send those in. Um, but I wanted to kind of make a little bit of a shift. I'm still talking about the same topic, but really um, addressing the fact that, as you mentioned earlier, You've been at UConn your entire career of in admissions, at least. Um, and that's become more rare in the industry, as I've heard myself when I tell people like, oh, yeah, I'm going into my 10th year at Champlain. Um, and it seems shocking because I think more and more we see younger professionals kind of moving around a little bit. Um, but I know I love my time here and I know you've loved your, your work at UConn. So could you just address a bit of, you know, what? was significant to you about your time there that has made you see you there? Um, and how do you keep your professional development and your networking fresh when you're at the same institution? For the- sure. uh, oh, this institution, like for 95% of what we, we talk to kids about, bottom line, when they come to college, the right college experience will change them. You know, it'll, it'll make them more mature, more experienced, more aware of the world. And I really grew and, and developed here at UConn. I, the experiences I had here were tremendous. Great friends, great leadership opportunities, uh, school government, um, different planning organizations. Just, it was a wonderful experience. When I started to recruit for UConn and to, to share that story, I sh- was able to share it from a, a place of total conviction. I knew what this was. I knew what it wasn't. I can tell you the truth. And luckily, and I'll, I'll say in, in all honesty, the fact that you kind of grown and changed and made itself better continuously, it's been something that I really appreciated. If we had grown stagnant, if we had grown kind of uninterested in being better, I don't know that I would have stayed, but it always seemed like we're going to continue to be a better place. And I liked being part of that. I, I, I liked being able to say, this is what we do. Um, so so no, no problem with that. I was also very fortunate to have good supervisors who let me try different things. When I wanted to do NIAC Act, they were encouraging. When I wanted to be involved with Pennsylvania ACAC or uh, do things you know, with NIACRO or, or the Women's Committee here for our, our union, whenever, no one ever told me no. Once I put the work in, no one ever ever stopped me. So I, I've been fortunate. I know it's not everyone's experience to have always had really good leadership where I've worked. So I haven't really had desire to change. I know plenty of people have changed. They've gone up the ladder and then they've gone down the ladder uh, sometimes with uh, you know experience with them in this profession. So I know I would probably be a director someplace else, but I've really prefer that the experience I have right now is sharing something I believe in and I've continued to believe in the the entire time. 
but you also do hit a ceiling. And one thing that is abundantly clear, and another reason to go back to school, is you need the credentials to get to the next level. You know, and hopefully I can get to a, another level in this line of work, but I needed the masters. I, I, you need the, the those two little letters behind your, your name in this profession to kind of get up to, you know, a, a more uh, senior admissions director management kind of level. So it's also important to get the credentials to help you progress in, in wherever you are and whatever you're doing. And it out of the, out of the boat, fresh out of school, never thought about that. Appreciate it so much more now because you need those to move ahead. That's good insight. And that's the thing that I think, at least for myself and probably others who are in the same boat are thinking about of, okay, you know, I've sort of hit this ceiling, as you mentioned, how do I, how do I move forward from here? Um, how did you end up, I didn't ask this earlier, how did you end up picking the master's program that you had, that you chose? I mean, did you, was it something that, that, caught your eye. I know you mentioned, you know, you appreciate the instructional side of it and work with students, you know, um, because I think that's something I'm still struggling with is how, how do I find something that I then could advance this career further? I think it, the, the important part is first thing, but what, what skills, what abilities or what interests do you happen to have? Do you want to go into mm -hmm. the marketing side, for example, I'm going to look at an MBA or something along the business lines. Do you want to continue with social media or um uh, you know presentations and how the university puts itself out there to the public that's perhaps more of a graphics or you know certain kind of programs that that deal with you know that aspect do you like human resources and perhaps the human resources program what i found in looking and thinking about what it is a, i enjoy about my line of work is I enjoyed working with our younger professionals. I was, I oversaw the Roadrunners, our temporary recent college graduates to help us with recruitment. I oversaw them for eight years, and it was always the best part of my job uh, was watching them go from I just got out of college to I've just been in uh, nine states in eight weeks talking to people from all over the place. And I've, now I really want to read applications and then I really want to go into this line of work or go to law school or go into, um, God, there's so many things my Roadrunners have done uh, after they left and, and helping them develop was always the best part of my job. Seeing them go was always the worst part because it was like watching my kids leave the, leave the nest, but it, it just made it amazing. And I really th thought if I could do something educationally that would let me incorporate training and development of, of young adults into professionals, I, I, I would enjoy that. I, I, there's something about it I could appreciate. And if I did it with related to admissions, I think I knew then it, it was, then it would just be all, all the better to be able to do that. So what I ended up finding was a, a program that really let me have that flexibility to develop, you know, instructional uh, and learning technologies. And along the way, I learned that I knew so little about the things that I could be em employing. So now that my next cycle of uh, working with people, I'm going to have a, a much better technology-based focused learning uh, platform to work with. But then I took classes like creativity, which wasn't, you think, initially tied to any one thing, but it was more about how you think about the world. And I definitely, from that course, took that I had limited myself and that there's so many different ways to express and, and develop and, and work with different people. I've, I've just been able, fortunate to take fascinating courses that developed me and helped me develop others. So that, that was good. But find a thing you love or a thing you really like and let that dictate what did you do next because it's never work and it's never a bad day when you do something that you love. You know, alternately, if I had not been doing this, we work at the Lego factory in Enfield designing things, <laughs> I love Legos. And that would never be a day of work. That'd be fun. But that's what made school and graduates so much more enjoyable than undergraduate was doing the thing that I, I, I loved and 
that helped mold me. Something I did not understand uh, when I first got out of school. So I'm always encouraging our, our younger staff to do not stay out of school too long because it's something it's it's an amazing transformative experience hmm. that's really that's that i feel like this is becoming a motivational podcast just as or episode just as much as a uh, informational one because that's a lot of really really great insight but it's funny because i mean you say you encourage the young professionals to start to, to not wait too long but I wonder, would you have had that momentous kind of realization had you started yours earlier? So I think it, it you know, our paths, you know, may help to kind of impact ultimately what we pull from from the program that we pursue. Oh, I definitely did not have, uh, when I was at their point in life, I did not have this perspective at all. I didn't. Um, and so knowing that, and some of them already, I, I'd be fair, some already thinking along the lines of f future uh, graduate work. But just knowing that I didn't, as much as people told me that I should, is my duty uh, and my obligation to inf inform others that this is what you should be doing. And don't make the mistake I made of waiting too, too long to do this. Um, with the understanding, you got to find the thing that you love. So don't rush into it, but don't wait mm -hmm. um, too long. You know, and it does get harder. I know when you people settle down and have kids and have um, mortgages and other responsibilities, so people still do it too. And I know people who have gotten their doctorates recently and other things, so it's doable, but don't wait. And, and that's a uh, lesson I will uh, bang the drum all the time for people to hear, uh, get to it early. Or if you if you go back, I did it. So there's no one I know that can't do it. If if I could do it, because it, it's it's doable. Awesome. Well, that's comforting to hear. I was gonna say I can't take your your, but I can take the latter at least. So uh, that's good to hear. As we close out, any last bits of advice or or thoughts on the subject matter in general? Any other insight you'd like to share with our viewers? Uh, you know, once you start this, you, you kind of want to stay in it. So I thought about going back for further graduate work. Uh, it, it, you kind of get the bug. It, you definitely do. One thing I will say is do not be afraid to ask for help, uh, particularly if you're not comfortable with the material or not sure how to, what you bring to the, the classroom. Again, I found these the graduate professors I enjoyed undergraduate because my undergraduate professors were great. Graduates, a whole different level of connecting with the people that are teaching you. So take advantage of their insights. They're, it's amazing what they know. And when you're an adult, your interactions with them are just different. It's just, it's different than undergrad. Uh, and even if you're not comfortable with something, tell them and they will work with you. And I found that more individualized experience wonderful. So don't be afraid. If you're not comfortable with something, you're not sure, there's plenty of help. And and you can you can do amazingly well. Even if my undergraduate GPA was nothing to be impressed with, my graduate GPA is substantially better in part because I was more mature. So you, you, you get so much more out of the experience, but you bring so much more to the experience too. So don't be afraid to try it. Awesome. That is excellent advice. Thank you. And uh, I hope a lot of the viewers, uh, myself included, take that to heart uh, to really think about how they continue to advance their careers. So thank you very much for being on Admissions Live, Jay. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. It's been a, a pleasure and uh, have a great day. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers. And uh, thank you, as always, to our program sponsor, M. Stoner. Uh, and we will see you in March for the next two episodes of Admissions Life. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining the